All right. How y'all doing? Great. You don't sound like it. You sound a little tired. Everybody went out to the fair. That's what it was. Yeah, they were smelling cow poo for two nights. That's why they couldn't sleep. That's what it was. Um, I love the fair. That doesn't mean I love cow poo, though, so don't make that, that attachment. All right, how's everybody feeling? You said good, so let's keep moving. Um, look, so uh, we are jumping into the new section of this year. So what we've done is we started the year, uh, well, we were online, but we started the year in, um, in the, uh, the Old Testament, and we've just tracked all the way through. So this last few months of the year, we're gonna be in uh, the, the end of the New Testament. So it'll be the epistles um, and Revelation, um, is, is kind of what we're gonna do, but we're not gonna attack it in order because we kind of had a pathway lined out because we're kind of trying to drive at something. Um, whatever, you know what I mean? It's just not gonna be in order, you know? So if you're, if you're expecting Romans because we just got out of Acts, sorry, we're in Hebrews. Like, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. So uh, we're in Hebrews today. Um, and uh, we're gonna be talking about faith. Um, and, and so I... I Basically, um, you know, as in, in preparation, something that struck me about, about this is, is that in these, these times, uh, faith is, a, is, a, is something that's easy to lose, right? It's something that's easy to lose. So for me, right, like for me in the last, in the last year has probably faith-wise been the hardest year of my, of my life. And, um, and a lot of that has to do with, I mean, COVID, I talked about this a little bit, but it has to do with, with COVID. And then um, last summer with all the protests and just all of the, all of the, 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 all the craziness that happened. Because in the middle of it, I'm going like, where are you? Right, like you gotta understand, I'm a, I, I'm a pastor's kid, all right? So last year was really weird for me. I grew up going to church like every day of the week. We went on Sunday, like y'all get that, right? But then we went on Sunday night because if you were really holy, you had Sunday night church. Sunday morning church was what you told all the riffraff Sunday night church is what you told the mature people. You know what I'm saying? That's how they did it. And uh, I'm not sure that was the best approach, but that's how they did it. And, uh, and on top of that, back in the day, we had Sunday school before church. So I got to church at nine o'clock, went to Sunday school, right? Then I went to church at 11 o'clock. And then after that, we went and had lunch and then we left in the middle of the four o'clock game to go to Sunday night church, you know? Like that's how it was every week. Um, and so we did that. But then on top of that, like there were various things that happened midweek, um, like, you know, children's plays, church children's plays. Everybody loves a church children's play, right? There's nothing better than watching kids be bad at acting, right? Um, <laughs> That's so messed up, but you all know it's true. You come because you wanna smile at the cute kid that has no idea what they're doing. You don't make fun of them because you're not a bad person. And if you do make fun of them, you're a bad person. And you can get saved at the end of service, we'll have an altar call. But for the people, that's what children's plays are. You go and you see the cute kid that's messing everything up. Uh, my first children's play, uh, I kept leaning back in my chair and my mom was the person directing the play, of course. And she's like, Robert, stop doing that. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. And I never did. And then during the actual play, I leaned too far back in my chair and fell on stage and knocked some decorations over. <laughs> so uh, there was that, you know, uh, you had that kind of stuff. But then also on Wednesday, you had Wednesday night church. Back in the day, you did Wednesday night church. Wednesday night church was like Sunday night church, but like a little bit less. We did a lot of church. Then after a while, we started doing church on Saturday nights because there's so many people coming to the church that we had to have a Saturday night service too. It was a mess. I grew up in church, right? Like I felt guilty about not going to church when I was on vacation, right? But we had to stop because I'd go to a new church and then analyze everything they did. And my wife was like, hey, uh, you're ruining this for me. Um, so, so like last year was just weird. It was like something that was a part of me was gone. And that, you take that and like, not only that for me, like the, the faith part, right? Is like, dude, okay, selfishly, like 
there's the big picture where you're like, man, this can't, like, this is not healthy for everybody. But then there's a the thing in the back of your head, like selfishly, like, dude, if we don't have church, I have to find a new thing to do, like to feed my family, right? Like, what is going on? And so you have all that, you know, and the pandemic starts and like, I'm screaming at the governor on the TV, like, you gotta open the church. And uh, he can't hear me because he's on the other side of the TV. And, um, <laughs> you know, and to be honest with you, like, you know, I think our governor's handled everything as well as anybody could in the middle of all this. So I'm not trying to make a political statement. I was just like, dude, we gotta have church. And, um, and so you have all of that going on and then the summer comes and it was just like, oh man, all the protests and, and, the, and, and the, 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 there's good causes and there's people trying to take over good causes for bad reasons and there's, and then you have nobody who gets in front of a TV camera can speak eloquently on what's going on at all. And it's divisive and messy and, oh. On the one hand, like, man, like the, all of the protests, I, like, we have things we have to fix. On the other hand, like, I feel like we're not fixing anything. We just have more questions and more screaming. And I don't know what to do. And what I would do is go to church and just start helping people, but church ain't working right. And so I spent a year not knowing what's gonna happen, feeling helpless, trying to figure out what I was gonna be when I grew up, that this wasn't gonna work out. And in the middle of it, started losing faith a little bit, right? I want to be a faithful person. I want to be a faithful person. I want to be somebody that is characterized by the strength of my faith. I, want, I don't want to just be a man of faith, meaning I believe in Jesus. I want to be a man that is characterized by faithfulness, right? The, 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 in, in the Bible, faith is characterized by trust in God and loyalty to him, right? But in the middle of all the yelling and screaming and all the craziness and all the questions about you know, whether or not you should get a shot or not, or whether or not you should wear a mask or not, or whether or not you should be in public or not, or whatever, I just started going, I don't even know where he's at. What the heck? And I, I, I say all of this to say this, faith is something that is hard to keep in these days. It's something that's hard to hold on to in these days. It's not something, it used to be that it was seen as a given for you. It was seen as a given for, for Americans to have faith, right? In polls, you'd see as many as 80 or so percent of the country saying they believe in God. Even if church attendance has fallen off to 20 to 30 percent of the country, you, people believe. But even now, we're moving further and further and further away from that. And so, as whether you like it or not, you're a product of the culture that you're in. That doesn't mean you're solely a product of the culture you're in. If God, if you believe in Jesus and the Holy Spirit lives in you, you are an outlier in the culture you're in, right? You get what I'm saying? But there are times when it gets messed up. There are times when you're not hearing right from the Holy Spirit, you're not getting it, and you become more like the culture you live in. And the culture we live in is not a faithful one. And so it, what do you do? How do you deal with it? Why is it so much harder? Where do we go? And Hebrews is perfect for that. So let me give you a little bit of uh, background on Hebrews. So Hebrews was written in the mid 60s AD and we don't know who wrote it, but we kind of know the time and the place. So it's in the mid 60s AD and, um, and it would have been written to Jewish Christians living in Italy. Sounds kind of cool. Like some of y'all wanna to go to Italy. Here's the problem. At the time, the emperor, his name was Nero. Y'all heard of Nero? Yeah, so Nero, uh, I think Nero's mom was also his sister and his dad was also like his step-granddad or something. The, champ, the family tree went like this. There weren't any branches. It just was, you know, it was messed up and Nero was messed up. 
Nero was crazy. This dude, would, he would take Christians, hang them on a pole, cover them, cover them in oil and light them on fire to light his garden, not as a punishment so that he could enjoy his house. He was crazy, right? And so there's a great persecution against the church during this time. And, and so um, a good reason for that is that in Roman culture, emperor, the emperor was God. You know, at least from the history books I've read and, and learned from, essentially they looked at their mythology the same way we look at the Avengers. It's a cool story with a moral to it and some heroes. But in real life, God was the emperor. Whether he was eternal or not didn't matter. He controlled everything. So in the Roman, in the, in the Roman Empire, which Judea is part of the Roman Empire as well, the, the, there's a persecution against Christians. He doesn't like Christians, and that's what's going on right now. So the writer is writing to Jewish Christians during this time and in that place so that, it, so that they could be reaffirmed in their faith. So if you take Hebrews and you boil it down, look, I, if you're one of those people who gets nerds out and gets into all the commentaries and, and concordances and the maps and the timelines and all that stuff, you're gonna hate what I'm about to say because some people <laughs> love the book of Hebrews and get super into it. But you can boil the book of Hebrews down to two things. Jesus is greater. So you can have faith. Jesus is greater, so you can have faith. That's what he's saying to these people in this time and place. He's saying, listen, everything you thought you knew, all the struggle you thought you had to go through on your own, all the laws you thought that you were powerless to live up to, but you had to try to anyway, that time is past. You see, Jesus came and he fulfilled the old law and now there's a new law and a new covenant and there's a helper to go alongside you in this process. Jesus is greater than what you know so you can have faith in these times, right? That's what, that's what he's saying. And, and, and I used to have trouble understanding this. I used to have a, a hard time understanding this because like, you know, you grow up in Sunday school and all this stuff. So you learn about the Old Testament and maybe you didn't grow up in Sunday school. Awesome, that means that you don't have to unlearn things that I learned. Um, but point being, you, you go to Sunday school and you get taught all this stuff and there's this, there's this dissonance because in the Old Testament, you learn all these values and all these things and, and they're all great. And, and there are some of them that are like really admirable and you should live by. And you know, the 10 commandments is a good, a, good, a good example of that, right? Like if you live by those 10 rules, you're doing pretty good for yourself. But, there's, but, but, but there is a hard break between pre-Jesus and post-Jesus right? That it doesn't mean that the Old Testament doesn't matter. It just means that the rules aren't the same for us anymore, right? And so when you read Hebrews, you can't go, you can't hear him talking about all the past stuff and then feel like, well, we kind of have to live by that law, but we kind of don't. No, we don't live by Old Testament law anymore. We live in a new covenant under Jesus and we follow what he had to say. Does this make sense? I'm not trying to diminish the Old Testament. You have to know it you have to know it so that you can understand where we came from. But we live under a new covenant with Jesus and we have a helper. We have the Holy Spirit that lives in us and it allows us to make it through these times. So that's kind of, you guys feel like you have a decent perspective on where we started and so we can go where we're going. All right, so this is, this is uh, we're gonna camp on the part about faith and, and it's three verses, that's it. It's in Hebrews chapter 11. It's the first three verses. He goes on after what we're about to read. He goes on to list off all of the heroes in the Old Testament who had had faith. And so if you track with what's happening, the writer is saying, hey, you, everything you know, forget about it for a second. Jesus is greater so you can have faith. And then he talks about faith and then he reattaches the Old Testament to what he's saying. And he says, listen, all of these heroes that you learned about, and he lists them off, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph. He says, these heroes... They had faith and God honored them for it because of this, because of this. And he's pointing out how it all points back to Jesus, right? But we're gonna camp in the three verses at the beginning of 11. So chapter 11, verse one. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what, was, what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Right? So what, what, what does a faith-filled person 
look like? And that's the first point. What does, the, what does a faith-filled person look like? That's what we're gonna unpack. What does, what does that look like? If I want to become that person, I should know some of the characteristics so I can chase those. Does this make sense? So what does a faith-filled person look like? The first thing is they're confident when they only have hope alone. When they only have hope, they're confident. Verse one says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for. You ever been in a spot where all you have is hope? Hannah's right. The hope that we have is not small. She said that during the worship set. The hope that we have is not small. The hope we have in Jesus is huge. That hope can sustain us. But man, sometimes you can get in this spot in your faith, in your life, where all you have is the hope of what's coming. Right? There, there's, I can remember speaking with older folks in, in, at different points in time and, and they've, lost every, you know, they've lost everybody. You get older, your friends die. That's how life works, right? And you'll see them look and they just look at you and they say, I'm ready to go see Jesus now. I hope I'm never in that spot, but you know what I've never felt talking to that person? I've never felt like they were hopeless. For sometimes hope is only on the other, only on the other side of glory. Sometimes answers to our questions are only on the other side of glory. But if I'm a faith-filled person, I can survive on hope all by itself. Why? Because my hope is embodied by Jesus. Right? The next thing that the writer says, you start back at the beginning of verse one. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. A faith-filled person is confident or is, is assured even when they cannot see. They have assurance even when they can't see. There are times in life, and this is kind of what I was describing before with myself, there are times in life when you have no idea what's next. You can't figure it out. Like for me, when I say like, I can see this, I can see that, I can see that, I'll say that a lot because I'm not great at a lot of things, but one of the things that I'm pretty good at is seeing what God, a vision that God's put on my heart and then chasing it and making it happen. That's something that, 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 that God's allowed me to do well, right? And, and so when I get in these spots, like last year was a huge, huge spot for me like that. And I just can't see what's next. I start to lose it, right? I just start to lose it. You, we all have those things, right? This is just my thing because, because I, I, can't, I can't see what's in front of me. I can't see what's next. And, and I can't see how we're gonna get from point A to point B. We were, this church is supposed to thrive and it's supposed to be great and it's supposed to change culture in our community. That's what it's supposed to do. How do we do that if we're not meeting together? And that's where I was at. Like, okay, God, I know what you've called me to do, but you're not letting me do it right now. And that's a really selfish way to look at an entire global pandemic. Um, but all of you know that your internal conversation is selfish, so be nice to me. Um, you deal with the, with the internal conversation so that you can be a decent person when you speak. Um, and, and so... That, that what? when you can't see, you ever been driving? It's a dark night, super rainy. Can't see anything. That's always the weirdest thing to me. You can't see anything. I hate that. I hate that, especially around here because there's so many deer. Um, and it would be a shame to kill one I couldn't eat. But um, <laughs> forget the car for a second, right? Um, the, there's, you can't see anything you're driving and all you can see is the yellow line here and the white line there. People who are filled with faith in Jesus, people who are faithful people, when all they can see is this yellow line and this white line, they're okay, they have assurance because they know God put the lines there. And all they gotta do is keep it between the lines. You just keep it between the lines. There will be times in your life when you have no idea what you're supposed to do next and you can't see clearly what God's plan is at all. 
And when you don't have assurance in those times, it can eat away at your hope. You just gotta remember your God put lines on the road for a reason. He knew a day would come when you wouldn't see well and he's gonna keep you between the lines, right? Verse two. Verse two doesn't sound important, but it's very important. This is what the ancients were commended for. So verse one says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. This sounds like whatever. They're commended for their faith. Yeah, you can't see God. Like we get it, right? But like you have to understand ancient times, man. It's not, they weren't commended because they had faith in a God they, they couldn't see. That wasn't all of it. They were also commended because they endured ridicule and they were seen as stupid. Every other culture in the ancient Middle East had multiple gods for one. So the Israelites were dumb because they only had one God. How can you only have one God? These people had all made God in their image. How could you only have one God? There's gotta be a God for the sun. There's gotta be a God for the harvest. There's gotta be a God for sex. There's gotta be a God for everything, right? How could you only have one? Not only did they only have one, which didn't make any sense to people in the time, they only had one and they couldn't see him. All these other cultures, they had, they had, they, they had statues. They had things that represented their God. The, the Israelites literally had a rule against doing that. And the times that they tried to do that, God was like, hey, yeah, I'm not, that's not cool. And punished them. They couldn't do that. So, so the ancients were commended for having faith in a God that they couldn't see. And it may seem silly, but that was a huge deal. It's kind of like you still having faith in the Washington football team. It don't make any sense. You're never going to see a win. I'm just playing. Watch them go out and kill whoever they play today. Um, but you do kind of get the idea. This is actually a solid metaphor, right? You have a sports team that you have no reason to believe that they'll win. This year, that is my Clemson football team. I'm a huge Clemson fan. They've won like every game for years. And they've lost two games this year and had terrible games even when they won. There is no reason I should flip on that TV and expect to enjoy myself. The, the wins are unseen. And I can't even go to the game. It's a long way away. A faith-filled person isn't afraid of ridicule. It's gonna come, it's gonna happen. I was talking about how faith isn't as big a part of the conversation now as it used to be. Is it interesting? Um, I was Googling uh, like the definition of faith or like Christian, the biblical definition of faith, like all that stuff. Um, if you ever wonder uh, how we prepare, Google is a much larger part of that than you would expect. And yes, we are a little bit ashamed of it, uh, <laughs> but Google's great. And so they, I, there are certain websites that I look for that you know, I know are reputable. They, they're tools and resources that we use. And one of, the, one of them that came up with the biblical definition was one that I used, but then there's this line chart that Google does. You know how Google's starting to do analytics on everything? They'll show you analytics on everything. Well, so all I do is Google faith definition and it gives me this line chart about the use of the word faithfulness in, in American culture. And it's from 1800 to today. And you see this huge spike in the 1800s and then it starts coming down. And in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, it's like super low and it starts coming back up. That makes sense when you think about the history of our nation. So in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, that was the heyday of the American church. The American church, there was, it was reported like 90% church attendance that you don't have to use the word faith because it's an expected part of culture. What, how, how strong does your faith need to be when you always have someone holding you up right next to you? You know, like even in the times when it gets challenged because people die and things happen, you have people all around you. It, it, at that point, you're dealing with community and community support almost more than faith all by itself. 
Does that make sense? It's starting to rise again. It's not, a, it's a great thing. It's good. We should talk about faith more, but here's the thing. It's rising again. It's something that we need more. It's something that we need more. We have to have stronger faith now than we used to. Why? Because it's not a given. It's not a cultural expectation. That sounds trite. You know, you may hear that and go, well, my faith is not a cultural thing. Yeah, but how, how supported do you feel when you can walk in a room and just assume everybody believes what you believe? That's part of why you're here today. But you don't feel that when you walk out those doors. you're going to encounter ridicule. It's a more common thing in our culture now than any time I can remember that Christians get made fun of. You know, good luck finding a comedy special from the 80s that makes fun of Christians. Good luck finding one now that doesn't, right? Like, it just, it just it's just where we're at. And you may think like, Robert, that's silly. Like, why would I be afraid of being made fun of? I'm a grown man. That's cool. You still got that scared 12-year-old inside of you. That's why you scream when people scare you, like a little girl. <laughs> That's why your wife knows things about you that she ain't gonna tell anybody else because you let her see the scared 12-year-old. Right? Like for me, man, it doesn't take much for me to turn into the seventh grader that's brand new at Milton Summers Middle School that doesn't know anybody because I just came out of the Christian school and is terrified and the lockers look 12 feet tall. And it seems like nobody there cares about who I am and nobody knows my name. And I just want to sink into the wall. Doesn't take much. Doesn't take much for that to come up. Nobody likes rejection. Nobody likes to be ridiculed. Nobody likes to be made fun of. And as much as you may act like it's not a problem, for some of you, maybe it isn't, and you should check your reactions to people ridiculing you. But for most of us, those of us that are fairly normal, dysfunctional, not weird dysfunctional, the, that is a huge deal. You walk into a place and you feel like you're going to be ridiculed. What do you do? You bottle it up. You don't talk about it. Why would I cause a conflict here? Why would I do that? And I'm not saying that you gotta be like, you know, nobody should leave here and make some new life flags and fly them in the back of their truck. Like, you know what I'm saying? You don't do that. A, the flags only last like a couple of weeks, so it's a bad waste of money anyway. But um, then they start looking bad. Just don't do that. <laughs> but what I am saying is your faith has to be overt. If it's not, how's it ever gonna make a difference? We talked about that last week. Like, people gotta know. A faith-filled person is unafraid of ridicule. Verse three, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. A faith-filled person will have answers that lead to more answers. And in our culture right now, it's popular to have questions that lead to more questions. Right, so we talked about last year a little bit. There's, there's some, you know, the, the conversation right now is all about deconstruction, 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 at least in people like my age and younger. It's, it's decon so basically what it is, is you take your beliefs, you pull them all apart, you find out what's messed up with them and you put them back together and you analyze them with a cynical mindset. I have a problem with this. My number one problem is I've never taken something apart and put it back together and not had extra pieces. That sounds like a joke, but I'm dead serious. You mess stuff up. I'm not saying that there aren't things in our culture, there aren't things in our, in our lives that we need to rethink. I'm saying that I can't go in saying, I don't care what the answer here is. I have to have a foundation to start with. My foundation is Jesus and that fixes everything else, right? Think about this. If we went into all of the hard cultural conversations we've had in the last year and we said, let's start with this, let's start with Jesus, let's start with love and let's go from there, how much easier would it be to fix it? It would be really easy. It's just that our culture doesn't wanna do that. Uh, a good example, anybody, 
So I, I had biology class and I was the kid that the teacher hated. But I was a church kid and I'd always ask her questions when we got into the evolution part that just made her mad. And I never let her get off on like a, uh, like just a throwaway answer. So like one of the questions I asked, and look, I'm not, if you wanna have a longer conversation about evolutionary theory, creation and all of that, I, we can do that later, but I'm just telling you a story. So one of the questions that I asked is, she's talking about some fossil that was like some 20 million years old or something. And I was like, yeah. Uh, so how do we know that was 20 million years old? Uh, radiocarbon dating. Okay. Um, how do we know that the half-life of carbon-14 is what we say it is? Well, scientists know that. They're smarter than you. I know, they're smarter than you too, but <laughs> she didn't like me. Um, <laughs> but, but scientific method says that you have to observe the whole process. It's not real until you've seen the whole thing. You're not following your own rules until you've watched the whole thing happen. And then once you've done that, you've studied it, then you can have a conclusion. Otherwise, it's all just a theory. And she, was like, she said something and like made me shut up and moved on with the class because I was an impediment to that class being taught. Like I was not a good student in that moment, right? But my point is this. Evolution is a great example of this. Every answer we have when they try to explain evolutionary theory still has the same question. But how did something come from nothing? How did that happen? I would be more than happy to believe it if you can explain that one thing, how did something come from nothing? So often in our world, our theories and the way we go about things, if they're not informed by the Bible, you have questions that lead to questions. And what I'm saying is a person of faith and you start with Jesus and he's first, all of a sudden your answers start leading to more answers. Does this make sense? Jesus is first. He always was first. He always will be first. He always has to be first. It, it, Jesus is God, God created everything. Therefore, he has to be first for anything to work right. He has to be first. If I start there in my life, I start to develop the answers for everything else. And, and I'm not saying I know everything. I'm not saying you know everything. I'm not saying all your answers are gonna be, all your questions are gonna be answered by the end of your life. Like I said earlier, some answers only come on the other side of glory, right? I get that. But what I know is that I have a God that has answers. I have a God of answers and order, not a God of questions and chaos. And if I am confident in my God and in the fact that he has answers, then I can ask hard questions. And from there, my faith only grows. Right? So if I wanna be a faith-filled person, I'll be a person that's confident when I only have hope. I'll be a person that has assurance, even though I can't see. I'll be a person, I forgot the third point, <laughs> that's unafraid of ridicule. And I'll be a person that have answers that lead to more answers. That's maybe it's not a full encompassing list of what a faith-filled person looks like, but it's a really good starting point and it's biblical. That, that's the man I wanna be. That is who we're all called to be. That's the type of people we're called to be. That person walking around our world will change lives. You know, I talk a lot about changing our culture and blah, blah, blah. I say that a lot and you'll hear it. And, you know, you, eventually you get tired of it or whatever. I don't know. But what I do know is this. We think of those things in grand plans and grand designs and in grand gestures. You know what I mean? Like in your marriage, right? You know, at least as a guy, if I wanna make my wife very happy, I always go straight to the grand gesture. Let me take you to this nice hotel. Let me take you to this nice dinner, although she's vegan and there aren't very many nice vegan restaurants, um, at least in my opinion. Um, <laughs> let me do this, let me do that. Let me buy you a ring, let me do whatever. It doesn't change, it doesn't move the needle. 
Why? Because my wife wants me to be good every day. If I wanna transform my marriage and make my marriage better, I better get better at taking out the trash. I better get better at rubbing her on the back in a moment when she's looking for it. I better get better at letting the dog out, right? I better get better at being kind and loving and gentle to my children. God's plan for our community is much the same way. We'd think of these grand gestures, but we could have a huge concert out there on the lawn and the whole county could show up. That's not gonna change anything. It's a bunch of people filled with faith in Jesus and dwelled by the Holy Spirit doing life every day better next to people. And if you're here and you're in the middle of a struggle, and you're in the middle of a fight and your faith is just falling apart. Just hold on, man. Like, just hold on. I serve a God of answers and order. He'll fix it. But you can't let go. At the end of the day, that's what a faith-filled person looks like. Do you know what a faith-filled person does when it gets hard? They just don't let go. That's it. Just don't let go. Thanks for watching another inspiring message from the New Life team. We pray that the message you just heard inspires you to grow deeper in your love for God and for others. Here at New Life, that's why we exist. If you'd like to take a step to grow in that walk, click the link in the description and fill out the connection card. See you next time.